Welcome to the Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by art making what you make. Today on the Creators of Sun City, Nick Feneff is a musician and writer who has teamed with Taylor O'Donnell to form Novel Novella, a hypnotic composition and performance group from the seacoast of New Hampshire and Maine. So subscribe to our channel, comment, and most importantly, watch Building With Us as we build community with you. Good afternoon and welcome back to the creators at Sum City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. I'm Tom Jackson and uh, with us today we have uh, a creator, a uh, musician specifically by the name of Nick Feneff, uh, somebody who I've known for a number of years and uh, know that he's uh, had a lot of, uh, a lot of musical adventures <laughs> with many, many different uh, area musicians. Um, so welcome to the creators, Nick. Thank you. Thanks for asking me to do it. My pleasure. Um, before we get to, I, I know you've got some new stuff that uh, we want to kind of focus on um, during this interview, but before we get to that, um, I like to kind of go back, you know, in the history of, you know, we have a number of different types of artists who have come on uh, the show here for interviews. and. Um, I always like to go back to you know where their inspirations began. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, can you remember you know, the first time you uh, picked up a, a musical instrument? Uh, I'm guessing maybe a guitar, and and really uh, kind of felt the urge to to learn how to learn how to use it really well as you do. Yeah, I, I can remember pretty explicitly. Uh, there was a guitar at my house that my mother had gotten as a wedding present from my father, dabbled with but never really learned to play. And I would periodically, every couple months, pick it up and my mother would say, you know, you could take lessons, you could learn how to do this if you wanted to. And uh, at the ripe old age of 12, I told her, no, 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 everybody who's good at music has already started. That ship sailed. I missed it. <laughs> and <laughs> which sounds hilarious to me now. Um, and then uh, actually someone we both know, Rob Wolf came into my parents' house and picked up this guitar and played a Nirvana song. And a light bulb went off. I was like, oh, I could do that with that thing. I didn't, I hadn't, <laughs> somehow I hadn't made the connection that even though this was an acoustic guitar that I could play a Nirvana song on it. And I was like, okay, sign me up, I want lessons. And um, I think that the guitar is kind of a, a tinkerer's instrument. Uh, um, people that learn to play the guitar tend to immediately start making up stuff. It, it somehow, it lends itself to feeling like you don't need to be an expert in order to come up with your own ideas on it. I think it's just the, the history of people who have made it famous, a lot of them are amateurs or not, uh, not academic. If you, if you play the oboe, you presume that you're gonna have to follow some pedagogical thing with teachers and universities and then still you're going to be playing someone who's dead's music <laughs> with it. <laughs> but the guitar, you're like, well, if, you know, if the Pixies can do it, then I probably could do. Um, so uh, writing and playing music were always intertwined. I always presumed that some amount of time I would be playing music that I wrote. To this point, uh, in, in hearing about your, uh, your musical history, uh, uh, we've we've heard Nirvana and the Pixies mentioned. Um, looking back at that time when you first really started to get into learning to play, um, who were some of the other you know early early influences or, or bands that you really liked? Yeah, the when I picked up the guitar it was kind of another golden era of guitar music. Although uh, I think that some of the classic rock people derided early alternative music because it was simpler in some regards, but uh, at that time you had Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, uh, Smashing Pumpkins, and all of that was guitar-driven music, and it was on the radio. Um, and so that was really inspiring as a young guitarist, but particularly Nirvana's catalog and Smashing Pumpkins really spoke to me. I learned tons of their tunes and 
aspired to write like that. Uh, it had elements of uh, immediacy, I guess, that, that, are, that I really liked. And so that was like the first, first wave. Um, and then uh, Radiohead uh, was probably the next like real sea change moment of being like, okay, well, what if the guitar didn't sound like the guitar? And that sent me off in another direction for the next, oh, I guess to this day. <laughs> I spend a lot of time be asking myself, what if this guitar didn't sound like a guitar? So that's a pretty pivotal artistic point for me. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, I think we start to get to uh, a place where you began to get into a number of local bands. And mm -hmm. if I if I remember correctly, uh, probably the, the first one that really started to uh, you know, make some noise, uh, if you'll pardon the, the bad pun, uh, <laughs> around here is uh, the Texas governor. Yeah, definitely. Tell us about that experience, if you would. Um, that was interesting. Uh, it, was, uh, it began with the Texas governor, a, a single person who wrote and recorded all this music in in his bedroom essentially and it was kind of uh it was before people were talking about like bedroom pop he was making these very simple very beautiful songs all by himself and they're really raw and then he decided he wanted to play them out on the road so he needed a band and uh a friend a friend of a friend like threw my hat in the ring. I don't even remember if I played guitar right away or if I played bass, but like the personnel switched around a little bit and then it coalesced into a version of a live band that would go out and play these tunes. Uh, I didn't have any like ownership stake in the in the music, uh, although we would play kind of our own interpretations of the music because it was hard to replicate live or, and it wasn't really the singer's goal to do that, so we would have our own way of negotiating the material, but it was, yeah, it wasn't involved in the writing process at any point. But it was fun music. And yeah, that's, uh, I, I remember that too. Um, and then uh, a area band uh, called the Tan Vampires. Yeah, the Tan Vampires were uh, a big part of my life for five or more years. And it started in a similar fashion with a person, Jake Merman, uh, who participated in the RPM Challenge, which if your viewers have never encountered it, it's something that ha started locally here, which was an informal challenge to write a record during the month of February. There's no prizes, it's just uh, see what you can do, focus and try to churn something out and, and live with it whatever it is at the end of 28 days and and Jake wrote this batch of incredibly beautiful songs and then started playing them with various groups of musicians in different ways uh, and then as that band coalesced he was he was still continuing to write so we were as a band increasingly involved in the arrangements uh, as the tunes were coming in and over time they came in more and more skeletal so that he would come in with ultimately like maybe a chord progression and a melody and then everything else would get hashed out in the room with six people simultaneously most of the time. So there was a lot more input uh, and a lot more of myself. Yeah, I think that's the, the most myself I've ever played guitar where I, I was free to play exactly how I would like to play or what I would like to play. It was never edited by anybody but me. Um, and that m music was, I'm still extremely proud of and it was a vehicle that took us around parts of the country and got us, got us heard wider than any other project I think I've done. So it was a pretty gratifying journey <laughs> overall. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think this next kind of question is, is something that... Um, I know some musicians who were with a particular band that maybe is no longer recording. Some musicians don't appreciate this question, while other musicians seems to seem to not mind it so much. <laughs> so I don't know, Nick. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
Uh, is there any chance of uh, the tan vampires uh, you know, doing something in the future? It's a great question. Uh, we have a record that's essentially finished and uh, got bogged down in, in committee process of trying to bring things to an end. The, I, I've learned that trying to keep things democratic in an artistic situation it doesn't tend to work very well because you <laughs> have six <laughs> particularly disorganized people who, but who have strong wills and opinions. Uh, so it's easy for every decision all the way down from like what does this drum sound like to what's, who's going to do the artwork. It can easily get hung up in a way where you, when you have um, when you have the person who's in charge. Uh, I play with a guy named Dan Blakesley, and there's no question of who is the final, who has the final say. Mm. He is the lyricist, the songwriter, the artist. And it's his vision, and I'm in his band, and I get to contribute to the music, but we never have a conference call about the artwork. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So the so the Tan Vampires have recorded music that I presume will come out be, just because I desperately want people to hear it. It was right at the end of the band, and I think we were functioning the best artistically that we ever did, uh, but the challenges of life uh, as it got more complicated, meaning wives, children, houses, things, th those kind of pressures made it, made playing live not work anymore. But the, the, when, we fin when we were writing that music, we were still probably at our peak creatively. So it just takes will <laughs> power to get it out into the world. So I hope so. <laughs> yeah. More likely than some other things. Right. But, you know, I think any sort of um, artistic endeavor that lends itself or is routinely uh, a collaborative effort, you know, to greater or lesser extents, not just musicians, but, you know, filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, or, or any kind of uh, an art that's generally done by a group of people, mm -hmm. you run into those sorts of problems that you were just describing, yeah. you know, uh, <clears throat> because it, it, you're right, it, it isn't really necessarily supposed to be a sort of democratic thing, yeah. <laughs> or it's nice to try to be democratic, but at the same time, you know, a lot of times it turns out that maybe, uh, maybe that's not the best way to get things done, especially the way you want them to get done, but anyway. Yeah, there aren't a ton of examples that I can think of 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 art that's made collaborati collaboratively that I really love. Like mm. it's often the vision of a person or two, mm -hmm. um, and and that the other the other players matter very much. But it's it's hard to create a situation that is truly that uh, democratic, for want of a better phrase. It's yeah, the yeah. clarity gets lost because it's not one person's vision and six people can't often agree about where they're going to go for lunch. So <laughs> trying to <laughs> like carry through an artistic vision to do something like create an album right. is good luck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Queen is an example of like a pretty democratic writing band. And uh, when I hear them, it sounds like four bands you, because you have four people writing with distinct voices. And if you listen to one of their records and uh, like they're Freddie Mercury's um, singularness ties it together, but writing wise it's all over the place. Mm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, we're going to get to some other, uh, some of the other things that you have done and are currently doing, uh, but uh, I want to go now to a little bit of an introduction uh, to your new project and then we'll hear uh, one of the songs that has been released from that new project um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to some of the other stuff. Uh, but tell me about uh, uh, Novel Novella. Yeah, so Novel Novella um, is a duo with uh, me and Taylor O'Donnell who's a, a amazing singer, 
she writes all the text and um, and we work collaboratively on the music uh, it's it started as a folder on my hard drive of half finished ideas that reviewing them started to feel like they had an aesthetic sense about them that I was like, okay, I could hear this being a record of music. And knowing that I wanted to work with Taylor on a project and kind of like waiting for something to click, you know, I've known her for years. And so I just threw her all these tracks and said, does any of this strike you? Do you like it aesthetically? And she was like, yeah, I really like it. And then just seeing what happened when she started to sing over these little snippets of music. Some of them would be 15, 30 seconds long. Some of them were more developed at that point, but they were in various stages of development. And uh, yeah, and now, now it's a band. We played a gig. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Um, let's hear one of the songs. Uh, give us an intro to uh, the, the first song you're going to play for cool. us from Novel Novella. So I guess what my thought was that I wanted to play part of a song and then maybe deconstruct a little bit for the audience. Sure, that'd so be like, great. So this is an unreleased track um, called In the Middle. And I'm going to play you part of it. As it's, yeah, it's not yet released. It's also not 100% finished, but it's pretty close. That's the first verse and chorus of In the Middle. Um, so this is a song, and uh, I picked this because it's, it's kind of typical of my process, that it begins with uh, a sound. And I, a lot of what I do comes from a mentality of experimentation and, and play as a way of generating ideas, like to try to stay out of uh, my analytical brain for as long as possible through the creative process and then when I get stuck then then turn that on so it, it begins with this uh, piano chord uh, played up really high in my lesson room where where I teach uh, at a music school uh, recorded with an iPhone just being like okay here's some here's some source material and uh, and then transforming that sound into this sound by slowing it down. And uh, when you slow down a sound, things that we perceive really quickly, details of them get kind of magnified, kind of like seeing something in slow motion, except we're, he we're hearing it in slow motion. So it pulls apart a lot of details that we're not able to catch quickly. Uh, so that in initial inspiration of like, well, what does this sound like when I slow it down? <laughs> and then taking that one sample and manipulating it to make the basic framework of the song by, by shifting it around in pitch. So that's all the same sample, just manipulated. Uh, 
So that's, that's kind of the, the basis of the idea of that. And then the percussion was built up around that initial thing. And that yielded just a, like a four bar section of music. And when I, when I got to the end of that, I was out of ideas for it. So I just put it aside. Uh, yeah, that's another like key <laughs> component of my process is, is to not feel like everything has to have a use right away. Like I'm not writing with a goal in mind. I just chase that particular idea for that amount of time and will let it sit for years if need be until it has some apparent use. So this had been sitting around, um, it looks like for a couple of years before I handed it to Taylor. Uh, and it was still only one section. So then we were, knew that we wanted it to be song form-ish, you know, like pop song form. So it needed another section. And so then I had to try to get back into the mindset of, the, uh, of this and create more sounds that, that sounded like it or lived with it well, uh, which is challenging uh, to do sometimes after the fact. But that's, that's part of just how I work. Um, yeah, and then handing that stuff to Taylor and not knowing what she was going to do with that material is really fun uh, for me. Instead of, we often, yeah, we almost never write in the room together. So it's me generating ideas, throwing them to her, her working on her own, throwing stuff back to me. And then once it gets pretty far down the path, then we'll meet in person and say, okay, this section really needs to be longer. Let's tighten this up. This phrasing doesn't work or whatever. And so does your ideas and things that you throw out to her, are they uh, primarily instrumental things and then she comes up with the melody and yeah. lyrics and so on? Or yeah. is there a lot of collaboration on that or that's pretty much the... It's, that's pretty much on. the division of labor. Yeah. Um, but she has brought in some, some fully formed pieces of music that she's written. Uh, but when she does that, she also releases them to me, and they usually come back to her unrecognizable. <laughs> so it'll be like a set of chord changes that she had a, a way of expressing, but I'll, anything, anything that she gives me, she knows is available to be changed. So it'll come back in a different time signature with a different tempo and a different, heart, you know, some chords subbed out for different things. You know, like I usually I never mess with her melodies because she's really, really good at that. Not that she's not good at the other stuff, but she, uh, yeah, I just I wouldn't presume uh, to enter into that arena with her. Um, yeah, and we and we we try to have no sacred cows. So like it, you know, any anything that I do is available to be edited by her and or just repurposed. So several times so far in the writing process. I will hand her something that I think is very clearly, this has got to be the chorus of the song, this has got to be the verse, there's no other way to hear it. And then it comes back and she's, rever she's reversed the roles of them. Mm -hmm. I'm like disoriented, but I'm like, okay, okay, cool. That's how you heard this, that's great. Let's move forward with that way. So, yeah, it's, it's nice. an unusual, uh, uh, yeah, it's atypical for someone who's played in a band where usually there's, you know, someone's got a tune that's partially done and everybody's in the room playing their instruments, uh, trying, to, trying to write a song together, with, also with the presumption that it needs to be able to be performed, <laughs> which is something that we explicitly don't worry about in the writing process. It'd be like, how do we reproduce this is not a conversation that we have. Mm -hmm. We just make the music and then now, now we're going through the process of being like, okay, if we were going to do this on stage, how do we translate these sounds? Some of them are easier than others, but it's yeah. been it's been freeing to not worry about that. It's got to be kind of um, uh, exciting, you know, to see where, based on the the other you know material that I've heard Taylor sing on, she's got such a great voice, and she's also able to really adapt really well to different styles from right. what I've seen. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's got to be kind of, you know, like to, to make an analogy, you know, if I'm working on a video, sometimes 
revisiting some of the, the stuff that's been shot for it, or if some other camera person does some shooting and then I look at the at the footage for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's kind of like Christmas time. You know, yeah. You're going opening up the Christmas packages and seeing what you got. Yeah. And uh, you know, I would think that with someone uh, as talented as as Taylor uh, and gifted, that that would be that would make it a fun part of the process. And I would think vice versa as well. You know, for her to to see what you've come up with. Yeah, I think that is a rewarding part of it. Um, and something that you mentioned that Taylor's keenly aware of. Uh, the, she's developed be her versatility was has been an important part of her career, and I identify with that too. I mean, we both get hired because we can do lots of things. Mm. Um, so, and some people really focus on doing one thing well, and that's the only thing they're known for. Uh, but we we've both in our in our musical lives tried to be versatile, and for her that meant coming into this project where. Uh, I think that she would say this is the first time that it's her that you're hearing. Uh, that there was an editing process of being like, these are all the possible tailors that you could hear. Uh, how do we pick, how do we narrow this down to a palette of sounds that feels cohesive? Because she can do whatever from track to track. So early on it was easy to be like, uh-oh, this one sounds like an R&B song, this one sounds like that, because of her versatility. So we, we did have a lot of conversations about that, about creating a voice for this music uh, so that it had some you know, self-similarity or identity. But she really enjoyed sculpting that, like seeing which bits of, of her vocal ability range she wanted to highlight and focus on and make the voice of novel novella. So that was yeah, an interesting part of the process too. A lot of times you have a singer in a band and you know, Billy Corgan can only sing like Billy Corgan, hmm. for good or for bad. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But and and then that becomes the sound of the Smashing Pumpkins. That because that it's it, Morrissey. You know, like these people who have like a very particular, singular way of being, and then the music is built around that. But this is the opposite of of someone who could sing like anybody, but has to choose who they're going to sing like. And yeah, so this is the creators, and we're here with uh, musician Nick Phaneuf and uh, talking about his new musical project, Novel Novella. Um, so one of the things that uh, um, uh, you mentioned when you were uh, uh, talking about that first song that you played part of was that uh, you also do some teaching. And that's something that just about everybody uh, who has appeared on the show so far has in common is a, a sort of parallel uh, career or parallel endeavor uh, of teaching uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. And that includes uh, our, our producer, uh, uh, Bill Rogers, and founder of the show, uh, and myself. Um, and so can you just tell us a little bit about the, the teaching that, that you do? So I teach um, a lot of private lessons on guitar, bass, things with strings. <laughs> I teach some ukulele lessons and I also teach uh, private computer music lessons. Most of that's out of a school in Portsmouth called uh, Portsmouth Music and Arts Center, PMAC. And, uh, and then recently I, I started teaching at Phillips Exeter, teaching music technology, which is more like production type of, it's more like this uh, than other things. It's, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a big and important part of my income for as long as I've been playing music. And of my peer group, there's a wide range of people who love the teaching and it, and it fits right in with the whole thing to I do this completely grudgingly. Um, I think that eventually if you don't learn to love it, then, then the whole thing falls apart because you, you, you need to, you need it because it's, it, it's, there's not enough money in just performing and making music and there's less and less all the time. Uh, so it, it, it needs to be there, but you have to find a way to really enjoy it. And uh, for me, it's really, it's really always been rewarding, and it just gets better over time as I'm more confident about what can be taught. <laughs> so I don't spend as much time beating my head against the wall as I did as a young teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, of the early days of teaching for you, uh, I, I wondered, 
not so much about the technical parts of it, but about the creative process. You know, trying to trying to teach that sort of process and help others along with that process. Is that something that that sort of came you know pretty naturally to you, or have you learned a lot in terms of how to, to try to articulate that to your students? I've definitely learned a lot. Uh, I think that um, that conveying information is something that comes naturally to me. Like I'm able to put things in a, in a present things in a logical way for people to receive the information. But I remember distinctly the first year of teaching me treating every student as though they were me, thinking like, I'm going to give them the teacher that I wish that I had had. Mm. Um, which is not to say that I didn't have great teachers, I did. But uh, for me, what I wanted was to have <laughs> no book, I, I, specifically no, no, no lesson book, uh, just to be able to follow the, the theory, music theory, train wherever it led us, uh, and I found that, that that was really wrong-headed, that there are as many different types of students as there are people, and that I needed to develop a lot of different ways to talk about the same stuff, depending on who the individual was and how they thought and, and what they wanted to get out of it. Uh, so yeah, over time, just the available tools to explain the same concepts have, have expanded. Teaching people to, to be or to harness creativity uh, is something that I get to do more now than, than more and more now than I used to. Most of it was like nuts and bolts, how do you get this instrument to do something that's been most of my time as a teacher. Uh, and definitely with the music technology stuff, I tend to talk about that a lot and with some of my more advanced students now. Um, yeah, so I. I think that the, the thing that I spend the most time talking about is the importance of limitations in creativity. You, I started off wanting to write a song that was never written, and now I don't worry about that at all. I, I just write and then edit afterward, um, and will write intentionally within some rule set. Uh, yeah, like if... I, <laughs> Let me take a step back. In thinking about what we might talk about today on my way over here, I was thinking about how the way that I have gone about making music on the computer was at first to try to understand like what were the limitations of this palette. And finding that there were very few of them, I realized that it was going to be important to create arbitrary rule sets because the blank page is the scariest thing for most people that I know that do that create, it's like making the first dot. How do you write the first word? Um, so, being able to generate random rule sets of like, oh, this is only going to have these three types of sounds, and work within that framework until it's not helpful creatively, and then you just break the rules. But the rules are there just to take away the fear of <laughs> the infinite unknown. Uh, and as long, yeah, like I said, they're, they're implemented only as long as they're generating useful material, and they can be cast aside at any time. That's the that's the lesson that I <laughs> teach over and over again about creativity. So, um, let's have another song from uh, novel novella. Sure. Sure. Let's see. So this is one that's out already. Um, it was the first one that we did, and it has a great video for it if you want to dig around and find it. Julian Koch, who lives in outside of Amsterdam, was stayed with me as like an exchange student and was into photography and moved home and I was like, hey, have you ever made a music video? <laughs> He's like, no. Nope. Like, Great, do you want to try? And uh, so I just sent him the song and said, do whatever you want. I don't I don't care what you do with it. Uh, so he made this beautiful short film and he just uh, emailed me today that he got accepted into a film program in the Netherlands. So it sent it, you know, he it just like sent him down a new path in his life, which is really exciting. That's great. So, this is called If I Do. Little patterns and dreams seem to fill the spaces 
We are here at uh, Some City Studios in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. This is the creators. Nick Phaneuf and Taylor O'Donnell have a new duo, uh, new musical project out that's called Novel Novella. And we're uh, getting a little bit of a uh, uh, preview of uh, uh, one unreleased song and uh, also uh, uh, one of the new ones that has been released so far. And you've mentioned to me that you're you're kind of releasing these over time, and that that gets to another subject that I know from some past conversations that I've had with you. The the music business and the way people release things uh, into into the world, hoping that people will listen to them, um, and the business itself has really changed a lot, right? In terms of not only the technology, but uh, the way distribution happens, the way promotion happens, the way hopefully, you know, you might be able to make a living when you want to make a life out of being a, a songwriter. So, can you talk about your experience with that a little bit. Yeah, um, I I came up during the end of the 20th century's music model of how there were record labels and bands and promoters and all of this infrastructure and all of this money that was floating around to pay all these different people. Uh, so I presumed at that time that I would be in a band and that we would need to sign to a label and that once you got there that everything would be taken care of by money and the mechanisms that distributed music. Most of, most of that uh, doesn't exist except for the very top level acts that still still use that infrastructure, uh, but it's increasingly irrelevant, but there's also, there's also, that's because there's no money going around. People aren't making, it's really hard to commodify a song. Um, I mean, anybody who was around when Napster showed up, that was the game changer where the, the value of the song went from whatever the dollar amount was you could put on a CD to essentially zero because everything was suddenly being distributed for no money. And it, and it was like the genie that came out of the bottle and you couldn't put it back. Um, so it's changed, you know, the market has changed since 2000 and now we have all these streaming services. But what hasn't changed is that for the person who creates the song, trying to get a single dollar out of a single person for that song is incredibly difficult. Uh, and you you hear people say, well, that's why 
touring's important. You make money off shows. Well, that's harder to do than it was before. And selling T-shirts is harder to do than before. And uh, yeah, there's, in my experience, there's just less money to go around at every at every level of it. And that the freedom that the modern artist enjoys is also just makes it more work than it was before. It's like I have the freedom to choose the artwork for my record, which wasn't true in the old model. There might be someone at the label who just says, "This is what your artwork looks like." Um, but now I have that. I have the freedom to make that choice. I also have to pay the artist out of my own pocket mm. to to make that happen. And every and everything is like that. It's like I I can promote myself and play shows wherever I want, but I have to do all of that legwork yourself. Um, so when I when I talk about this, especially with students, about you know what is this world that you're entering into of, of, of professional music, like you need to be good at your instrument, but it's really really important that you're good at sending emails because you're going to spend as much time, possibly more, <laughs> doing that than you do actually making the music. It's all the other work that it's for a really brief period of time was offloaded to other people. It was. Uh, externalized or whatever to other parties is now all that comes back to the artist. Design the flyer, print the flyer, hang the flyer, uh, every thing that everything that is work to be done is done by the artists themselves. Which I, th I think for a lot of people just means that it's it's harder to stay in the game, it's harder to stay creative because it's really a slog to do all that other stuff. Yeah. Well, um, you also have some other uh, bands locally that you're involved with. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the other bands that you play with right sure. now? Yeah, I, I play with a group called the Soggy Po Boys, and uh, that's a group that that focuses on a particular type of music, which is the, the jazz that came out of New Orleans. So it's from Dixieland, early proto-jazz of uh, Fats Waller, Louis Armstrong, and then some of the um, funky stuff and the Caribbean music that influences music from that city. And, and we, as a band, try to study it in a kind of a academic fashion. You know, like we really dig into the different artists and how that music came about and try to do it as well as we can. And then we also, as a band, try to write in that world. Um, so that that has a a rule set, speaking of rule sets, <laughs> uh, where everybody understands that there's certain types of things that the music's not going to do or probably will do, uh, which, which is both, yeah, it cuts both ways. It, it, it's hard to contribute something new to a rich history that has a pretty specific rule set, uh, but it's also kind of freeing to be like, we're not reinventing the wheel, we don't have to make new jazz, we're trying to contribute to um, a body of songs that we think are a beautiful time in American music history. Uh, and everybody in the band writes and we perform a lot. Like the last three years, is uh, it's 100 to 150 dates a year. So the band is playing all the time and it's uh, writing-wise the opposite of novel novella where uh, it's written on the bandstand in front of people. You know, like someone brings in the bones of a tune, but the the first time any of us hear it, an audience is hearing it at the same time. Like when somebody brings in a chart and it has the all the information that the individual players need in order to execute it adequately, and then go. We're on stage in front of people and we're going to try it out, and then and then we just refine our way of expressing what was put in front of us on the bandstand with very little ever happening outside of that context which is an interesting way to write and I think it is it that part is very connected to how the music that we're trying to write like was written you know in in clubs people playing music together that uh, yeah the, the composition is is generated live. <laughs> And, ch and different every time, you know. There's like a there's a, a road map that develops in certain points that you know you're going to get to, but um, but that there's a lot more freedom from performance to performance to do it differently. 
So that's Soggy Pro Boys. Um, and then I and then I mentioned Dan Blakesley. Uh, he is an artist who's from this area uh, originally, but uh, has been was in Boston for ages and now is in Providence because artists keep getting priced out of places. So <laughs> you got to find a place that where where the low overhead is low enough to be an artist. So you know it's hard to do that. You used to be able to do that in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is a nearby beautiful seaside town, but you, you couldn't just make art and live in Portsmouth anymore because, yeah, the overhead costs are too high. So anyway, he's in Providence. He's a, he's a folk musician in the truest sense. He, he writes music ab about his personal experiences and the places that he, that he has lived. So the songs are about North Berwick and Boston and Portsmouth, and, uh, and I love playing his music for that reason, because it feels like he's going to leave behind these stories of the time and place that I live in, and that, that's really powerful to me to be a part of. Providence, Rhode Island is actually a, not to change the sub subject, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's actually a, an old stomping ground uh, of mine from a long time ago, and there there were some legendary clubs there back in those days, in like the early to mid 80s. and. Uh, it was the living room and a place called Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel. I've played at Lupo's. You have played at Lupo's? Yeah. Oh, wow. With, so that's still the, there. Yeah, Texas wow. Governor played there. That's been there for a long, long time. It was and still so, an awesome room when I was there. I wonder, has, has Dan played there? Uh, I bet he has. Yeah. I, I, that's a good question. I haven't played there with him. There's a new place called the Columbus Theater that's pretty magical. It's like an old movie theater that... The, uh, guys that are the group called Low Anthem took over this space and, and turned it back into a viable performance space and recording studio. It had been just like a derelict old theater for ages. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's definitely the, the happening place to check out down there these days. Are there maybe a couple of bands that come to mind uh, that are you know, current or maybe even relatively new that you find, you know, that you really enjoy, whether they're local or wherever they're from? Um, yeah. Most of the, the new music that I hear either comes from my students, <laughs> because I ask them what they're listening to all the time, because it gets increasingly hard to stay on top of what's happening when you're no longer in youth culture. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the two off the top of my head that I can't stop listening to are Frankie Cosmos and uh, a group called Always, which is inexplicably spelled with two Vs instead of a W. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> because the random band genera NAM generator maybe kicked it out, I don't know. <laughs> um, but they both, it's funny, they're both kind of similar. They both have female vocalists. They're both kind of uh, lo-fi indie, rock, whatever that is, sounding. And uh, I can't get enough right now of the sound of uh, a woman singing in a, like a blasé way, like she did. <laughs> it's, like, it's like we love our men to be emotive and we want <laughs> our women to not care or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, but the music's right. very simple and, and the lyrics are really simple. And I've been thinking about just how uh, any art form, I think it has some cycles of uh, simplicity and sophistication and that those two th forces are at odds. You get your, your ELO and then you get your Sex Pistols or whatever, mm. you know, like these reactionary movements back and forth. And, uh, and so I'm currently feeling like saying things plainly and playing music simply is kind of like the height of sophistication is a way of saying that I could have done this more complicated, uh, but I chose not to. And it, it's not always the case, like with punk music, like, like the Sex Pistols, they couldn't have played it any other way. They, that was, <laughs> they were working within their limitations. Right. But this music strikes me as, as it, intending to be the way that it is, uh, and it really just, yeah, does something for me. That's uh, interesting <clears throat> to hear, you know, that's, that's actually part of your thought process and the creative process because when I <clears throat> when I think of artists of various types 
who who have done you know a sort of, sort of similar thought process. The, the classic example for me is uh, uh, I remember in, in like some art history class or something when I was first in college, uh, seeing this pen and ink drawing that Picasso did when he was 16 years old. And it's just a drawing of a guy, but it looks it's so incredibly well detailed it almost looks like a black and white photograph right and then you think about all the incredible directions that he took his art um, so he he could do you know he could do that sort of really accurate depiction of something but then he took it and went in all kinds of different directions in a way you're kind of with that songwriting description that you just talked about you're kind of going the the other way you've been all in these different places Stylistically, and now you're you're going towards a more simple, straightforward sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Picasso's a great example of. I, I think about him and an artist like that of, of that uh, what, as a teacher and as a musician of being like, you want to have all the tools you could possibly have available. Get as good as your instrument as you possibly can, and then elect to not use ninety five percent of that but know that if you needed that perfect thing that you'd be able to grab at it and and get to it but ha being able to do it and choosing not to is is really powerful it just yeah it's just make sure you're saying what you mean to say and not because you can say it um so uh, I like to kind of uh, leave a little bit of an open space towards the end of an interview uh, in case there's anything that you wanted to mention or talk about that we haven't gotten to? That's a good question. <laughs> well, um, people should keep their eyes and ears out for new novel novella stuff. We'll be, we'll be releasing tracks probably one at a time for the next several months and, and starting to ramp up live performances. We'll be uh, local again in August. I don't know when this series will, will start to air, but um, but whenever it is, there should be a show coming up after that because we're it's a goal of ours to be out there in person more because I think it's a way to connect people with the music. But that the music will be coming out hopefully continually for the foreseeable future. And where and how can people find these, uh, these upcoming releases from Novel Novella? Um, if you go to Bandcamp, that's and search for novel novella. That's that's the easiest way to give us your money and say that you support it. You can listen to the tracks for free, but that's the most direct model currently available for someone who's interested in the music and wants to get music to the artist. It's probably the most favorable way, short of sending cash to my house, which <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just put my address in the credits and be like, just right. send twenty dollar bills whenever you think of it to Nick, and he'll keep making music. Short of that. <laughs> Bandcamp is a great way to support artists, um, but our stuff will be wherever you look. It's in iTunes, Spotify, YouTube as, as rips of the track, so it should be, it, we make it our business to make it easy to find the music. Uh, and wherever you want to listen to it, I'd be perfectly happy for people to be listening to it. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, let's have one more uh, song from cool. Novel Novel. Let's see if I can find something also unreleased, because that would be exciting. If it's fully fleshed out and unreleased. No promises, though. Let's see. Oh, I think I do have something. I'm going to pick a track called Lullaby. This is an example of a track that Taylor handed to me, more or less finished. Uh, musically and that uh, I reinterpreted. And you'll hear a guitar sound in it. Uh, Taylor, Taylor's a multi-instrumentalist. She wouldn't, she wouldn't say so, but she's a, she's a pretty good piano player and, and is a, a, a competent guitar player. Uh, so she handed me a recording of her singing and playing this, this song. And the guitar sound that you hear is from Again, her iPhone recording of it, I just cut it and then treated it as a sample because it had such a, a weird sound because of her execution and the particulars of where she recorded it. 
So I could, you know, I could have replayed it, but I thought it was more fun to just use the, the beat up sounding thing that she sent me. What's the name of that one again? Lullaby. Beautiful. Yeah, I'll just, if I may, just, yeah. uh, if you're not already listening to this on headphones, do at some point. The, the details are the things that I get uh, excited about. So this is the sound of a match being lit that's periodically in the song. And then there are sounds of doors opening and closing things that were just uh, found sounds or things that I recorded around the house that then become part of the landscape of the song and give it some identity. When you have all these electronic instruments, you gotta bring in elements from the real world to try to give it that uh, organic feeling that I, that I want it to have or to feel believable or something. <laughs> yeah. And specific. From novel, novella, a uh, new project, a new duo uh, with Nick Phaneuf and Taylor O'Donnell. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show today and uh, hope we'll uh, be hearing from you uh, in live shows and also uh, be keeping an eye out on Bandcamp for uh, Novel Novella's next release. Um, so for now, I'm Tom Jackson. Uh, thanks for watching The Creators here at Some City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. Uh, please smash up the likes uh, if you are inclined to do so and subscribe. And uh, we will see you next time on The Creators.